Hi everyone, welcome to our second of our end of tax year series of webinars, which is about innovative tax tips for business owners. We are just going to wait for a minute or two for the attendees to just join us. And as always, we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A afterwards. So I hope you do enjoy this, um, you know, lots of material, fun um, ta tax tips filled webinar and uh, do ask us plenty of questions afterwards. And uh, also just a reminder, you can find the uh, Q&A or chat function on your right hand side. So if you have any questions, you know, whilst we go through the slides and whilst we go through the webinar, please do type it in to the chat function. Um, both myself and Henry are monitoring it and then we'll go through all of them in the order at, towards the end of these, uh, the webinar. <clears throat> Great, let's get started. <clears throat> so again, thank you all uh, for taking the time. I uh, really appreciate it that everyone you know, has taken time out of a busy day to join us. Um, again, today, we're just gonna go through some innovative tax tips for business owners. So very much a um, business owner focused um, webinar, right? Focusing on like, you know, what kind of tax solutions are there to help you before, um, as we approach the end of the 2023, 2024 tax year. So today's agenda, right, it's going to be about, first of all, you know, ways that directors, company owners, shareholders are able to tax efficiently extract the profits in the companies. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about corporate structuring opportunities, right? So how via corporate structure, you can, you know, um, again, use some um, structuring to reduce your tax bills. Um, then I'll be talking about the corporate financial planning areas, right? So again, um, ways, you know, hopefully, um, ways that you can utilize better your company's cash and um, also covering some smart tax solutions, both from the company perspective and from an individual, the director's perspective. And of course, lastly, covering the Q&A session. <clears throat> Joining me today is uh, Henry Smith Language, uh, who's a senior tax advisor at the Fusion Tax Team. Again, very experienced. He'll be kicking off this um, webinar with some of his great tax tips. As always, as a thank you for attending, right, we're offering a complimentary financial and tax consultation. So please do get in touch. You'll get to see our contact details on each of the slides. So send us an email. <clears throat> Fusion, you know, as many of you know, is a 360 degree advisory firm covering all aspects of professional services. You know, we had today, we have Henry from Fusion Tax and I'm from the Fusion Financial. We we'll help both private and corporate clients. We also have Fusion Accountancy, Fusion Law, Fusion Recruitment, and uh, more. So again, if you're interested in having that 360 degree solution for your business, please do get in touch with us. <clears throat> right, over to you, Henry. Tell us how we can you know, extract some profits tax efficiently. Thank you, Chenji, and uh, hi, everyone. Just a sort of brief introduction from my side. So I'm the Senior Tax Advisor here at uh, fusion and what what it is we're coming up to the end of the year now and obviously the uk is unique in many ways but one of the ways in which we're unique is our tax year ends uh right at the start of april but in theory we shouldn't really be leaving it until april to do any sort of tax planning tools or techniques that may or may not be applicable to you so i uh as part of sort of being a business owner means that you have the flexibility to effectively manipulate how you take money out of your business. So of course, if you are a limited company owner, for example, you can choose how much dividends, when uh, you will pay those dividends from your company to either yourself or maybe even your family members. So if you put your wife on the payroll, if you're uh, married or your husband and you effectively manipulate the amount you take out of your company in order to effectively use your tax bans and your tax-free allowances, et cetera, et cetera. And 
for the most part, a lot of these allowances, and most of you will know, the personal allowance, dividend allowance, all of these sorts of things, it's use it or lose it. So if you are coming up to the end of the year and you haven't, you maybe made a decent profit in your company and you're thinking, how can I take money out of my business tax efficiently? Then this is definitely the webinar for you. Uh, there will be obviously a couple of key ways in which you can take money out of the business, but mainly when you are in a fortunate position where you have a business and you've made some profit, you can choose how to leave that money in the business to continue growing or, or it's working capital to use towards maybe other business uh, development or growth uh, uh, possibilities. So, or you may choose to take the money out of the business, in which case, as you know, you get hit with a tax charge. So companies, as we know, take, pay tax at two levels. So corporations pay corporation tax on their profits and any tax that's paid, uh, any profit that's made, you take the tax away that you've paid at the company level and then you pay it out via either a dividend or a salary to the shareholders or directors or maybe your family members. And at that point, of course, you're paying another level of tax. So that's the secondary tax charge, which is on the income tax or dividend tax. So what we need to look at is maximizing your dividend allowance. So each year there's an amount you can take out tax free uh, from your company without take, paying any tax. Currently it's 500 pounds, um, but that is going to be, as we've seen in the last few years, it has been reducing. So the point at which you will start paying tax on dividends will start to increase. In addition, pension contributions. So when you are, uh, if obviously if you're self-employed or if you have a company or a business or a partnership, then you are not likely uh, automatically contribute to a pension scheme through an auto enrollment that all salaried employees in the UK are likely contributing to. So if you are, unless you've opted out, of course, but if you are uh, in a position where you're coming out to the end of the year and you have surplus cash and you are thinking either I'm going to take this money out or I'm going to leave it in my company to continue to grow uh, and, and keep it aside for a rainy day, then if you are considering pension contributions, these are great because they are corporation tax deductible, plus any money you pay from the company to your pension uh, is outside of inheritance tax, which uh, Chenji will talk a bit more about later. But the good thing is with pensions, of course, you can't pay the bills necessarily for your pension unless you're at retirement age. Uh, but they're a good way of putting money aside for a rainy day and effectively making sure that you are maximizing the amount you can put in to your pension each year. So there is a limit currently of 60,000 pounds per annum, which you can put in to your, uh, into your pension and get the relief. There is also carry forward from prior years uh, up to three years, which uh, again, we'll talk a bit more about later. But I think the, the, the one point I wanna make here is that let's say you are a one person, one man band and you have uh, you know, other, pers uh, other family members that you are considering uh, giving shares to, then there is some tax considerations about giving perhaps some dividends to your other uh, members in your family so that they can utilize their dividend allowances so that their overall your sort of net tax bill goes down. We'll just move on to the next slide. So when also we talk about a lot with our clients, this idea of corporate structuring. And when you are someone who has a, a business, maybe you are a serial entrepreneur and you have several businesses uh, all at the same time, and maybe they're different limited companies. Of course, you have uh, capital allowances, which each company, like if you are, for example, uh, trading and your main trade is in uh, providing accountancy services, then you can claim what's called capital allowances to offset your profit for the year. And capital allowances are very important because each company has its own entitlement to capital allowances. So when we are uh, looking at your end of year uh, profit position, and let's say you've made 50,000 pounds of profit, then you can consider making a large one-off uh, expenditure for capital allowances. And this can be things like electric cars and uh, other sort of plant machinery anything you really use for your business that is a fixed asset uh, to effectively lower your corporation tax bill 
for the year. So whilst you might still have the, uh, you know, you you might not know until towards the end of the tax year how much money you're going to expect to make. At that point, you need to consider what can I afford to spend? Should I get it this year or maybe next year? Maybe this year you're in a loss. So of course you will get more tax advantage if you wait until next year when you have a profit to make that contribution, uh, that one-off uh, expenditure for a piece of capital allowances, uh, fixed assets. And for residency, I don't really want to talk too much about because it is very, um, I think a lot of clients that we speak to who are, especially in the fast growth sectors, are noticing that they do want to look at reducing their tax bill by leaving the UK or perhaps setting up a company outside of the UK. And whilst I don't necessarily think this is uh, a, 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 it's a bit of an oversimplification, typically if you are a UK resident and you're looking at setting up your corporate uh, structure overseas, then a word of warning is it probably doesn't work how you think it works because there are a lot of anti avoidance rules that exist that make sure that you effectively, if you are operating a business outside the UK, but effectively making all the decisions in the UK, chances are it's going to be a UK company, even if that company is not in incorporated in the UK. So that means it's subject to UK corporation tax. So all of these points about capital allowances and dividends will still apply to this company, even though you think it's not UK resident, it could still be resident for tax purposes. So something to bear in mind that setting it up overseas might not necessarily lower your tax bill. Cool. <clears throat> Good one, Henry. Um, you know, with those capital allowances, you know, what 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 about things that you kind of like, you know, use both for the business and personal? Can you claim partial capital allowance or can you not do it at all if there's any personal element to it? Um, yeah, it, it, it's a very good question, Chedji, because when you are, let's say, if you work from home and you want to buy a car, uh, let's say an electric car, you are going to, uh, of course, inevitably end up using that car somewhat for business purposes and somewhat for personal use. So if you are using that car for business, which means maybe driving to see clients or you're driving to see uh, suppliers or something like that, th that would be defined as business use, in which case you do get the capital allowance offset for that business use. So what we typically recommend is, of course, you don't exactly know how much of your car you're going to be using for business and personal. If it's owned by the company, then you may just want to buy it in the company and get the full capital allowance against the company. And then any personal mileage you use, so if you drive it to go to the supermarket for your weekly grocery shop, then that would be considered personal use of a business asset which does result in a tax charge, so a benefit from the company, because effectively you are benefiting by having a car to use for your own personal uh, discretion. So there, you know, in the first instance, you should look to bring it into the company, but the question here is, how much of it am I really using for business? And if the answer is probably more than half the time, then it's certainly worth considering uh, putting it in the company. Yeah, and you know, also like for those kind of you know, for people starting off, and they may not have like such a big profit coming in or like a big revenue coming in right in the first year, so they might be actually like you know contributing a lot of their own money into into the business, right? So um, does the capital allowance carry over the next tax year, right? So if you buy something but don't have enough profits to offset against it, can you use the rest of it for the next tax for the next year or for the following? How does that work? Yeah, it, it, another good question. We have uh, so if you if you're in a lost position, of course you don't get any benefit because you're not going to pay any corporation tax at the end of the year. So if you are by the let's say your year ends in March and you're in the end of February and you're pretty sure you're lost, you're going to lose money for the year of about hundred thousand pounds. And of course, if you then buy a fifty thousand pound car, you're further exacerbating your loss. So you have a hundred and fifty thousand pound loss for that year which does get carried forward to a future year that has a profit, but obviously from a cash flow perspective, it may not, there, there, there's not a lot of immediate benefit by investing in these assets sort of sooner rather than later if you're in a loss position, because if you're in, by the end of the year, let's say next year, you're in, at the end of February and you have a hundred thousand pounds of profit and assuming there's no carry forward, then you could say, well, I'm going to invest in that car now, 50,000 pounds, suddenly that's offset against my 100,000 pound profit. So I only have 50,000 pounds of profit. So your corporation tax bill a year, 25% on 50,000, so about 12,500 pounds, which you know is an immediate cash saver 
from that expense. So whilst yes, overall you're in you're in the same position, um, it's about the timing of that transaction which gives you the most tax advantage. Yeah, and I think that's all the point about capital structuring, right? You know, like again with uh, with co with company directors, you can make if you time your director's loan account well, right? Um, we could probably like you know help your future tax planning um, by I don't know spending money actually. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, and if you're going to, as well, if you're going to buy these assets anyway, then it's um, it's no skin off your nose. You're going to do it anyway, so you might as well get the tax back uh, from your corporation tax return. Yeah, and um, I think, you know, um, not to touch on anything politics, but in case, you know, a government change happens and there is a change in corporation tax potentially in the future, right, by making some smart, you know, capital allowance investments right now could even help offset, you know, a potentially higher rate in the future, right, even though you may not make it immediate um exactly. you know savings um but yeah so moving on um on to corporate financial planning so this is essentially like you know how the future financial arm is that helps clients um maximize um business funds right and then make it make it into the most tax efficient way so um a lot of business owners right that we you know our clients you know people we talk to right people get introduced to um, always come to us and say, right, um, we've, just, we've got a bunch of cash sitting in the bank, right, you know, and it's not really doing anything for them. Um, and this is, again, where, you know, something called the corporate treasury, you know, really comes in, uh, comes in play. So big companies do this, right, they have a CFO, they have a finance director, right, that, you know, keep managing um, clients, you know, that, you know, their company's cash flow, right, so... For you know, a company might say, right, we've got we've got working capital requirements, right? Then we have you know sort of shorter term capital expenditures, right? You know, perhaps buying that piece of machinery for um, the capital allowance. We have medium term, and we have also long term um, expense requirements. Now, in that case, right, you can then match your money that you have, right, the cash in the business, right, um, with those expenditures, and you can place them into different types of you know either cash in the fixed term deposits into certain bond type products or in instantly accessible um you know money market funds for example or you know even just like an instant access cash as well so this way you get to really maximize the interest rate that you get from that cash sitting in your bank account because you know again we talk to so many business owners that have because they're just so busy working on the day-to-day -day, that they have so much cash in a you know high street bank account earning literally zero percent interest and that is you know money off the table now, following up on that, it's company investments, right? So again, there are some certain, you know, some companies may have funds that are not needed for the long term. Um, in which case, right? Um, and actually, a lot of business owners don't know this. They can, they can actually. So they want to invest money. They want to, you know, maximize their ISAs. They want to, you know, um, invest personally, but they also don't want to just take out a big dividend uh, and pay, you know, thirty two, thirty two point five percent, thirty eight point one percent in dividend tax. Um, but they didn't know that they can actually invest that money in the business, right? So what happens is actually, right, similar to how a person can buy stocks and shares, your business can buy stocks and shares. Now, there are certain types of investments that are also quite tax efficient for companies, right? So in the UK, right, if you if you buy in, you know, certain funds that produce a dividend, right, and as long as those funds are, again, UK-based, certain, um, you know, um, rules are followed and rules are satisfied the dividends they get you know, the company gets is actually free of corporation tax so if for example you're earning a dividend from this particular fund of ten thousand pounds per year um that ten thousand pounds is actually not taxable uh, to corporation tax and there is actually a box in the uh, corporation tax return that actually you can fill um this figure onto so um and again, you know, some people, that, you know, again, don't again don't want to pay a dividend tax, to take the money out, but they still want to, you know, make some exciting investments, you know, either in their friends and families, you know, new startups, or you know, into like, you know, for example, these days, artificial intelligence, right? That's like the big, big, big sort of hot topic right now, right? Um, it's possible for you to actually use company funds to invest in both public, um, you know, share listed shares and in private company shares as well. Um, and lastly, corporate insurance, and I always mention this, and, uh, you know, I think we're, we're now in the middle of, uh, you know, winter, hopefully towards the end of winter. Um, you know, a lot of people like business owners like skiing. Um, so, like, you know, these are sort of hobbies that can be quite dangerous. And uh, before they go, they'll go away, right? The family members usually say, uh, do you have insurance? What, what, ha what actually happens if you, you know, something, 
if we were to fall off a cliff, God bless. Um, so, and, uh, you know, by having a business, we can actually put those kind of life insurances in the company and it, it's tax deductible, um, which again, you know, even with a company car, if you, if you buy a car for yourself, right, you have a benefit in kind tax, but with the actual personal life insurance, right, it's whereby the business pays for your life insurance premiums and your family gets the benefit of that payout, right, in case of death and serious illness, right? This is actually not a P11D benefit. So it's not a benefit in kind, there's no personal tax to pay and the business gets the full amount of corporation tax deduction. So if the premiums are say a thousand pounds per year, right? The net cost to the business is only 750 pounds after taking, if you're a 25% corporation tax payer and the person, you know, and the actual director being covered has not paid any um, um, income tax or national insurance on that as well, right? There's various types of business protection you can explore, things such as re relevant life plans, key member uh, protections and shareholder protections as well. If you're in a company with multiple shareholders, right? So again, um, you know, happy to explore these options for business owners out there. <clears throat> now onto some smart tax solutions um, prior to the end of tax year. So tax loss harvesting, right? Um, what Henry mentioned, you know, started off this meet, uh, the webinar with, you know, again, some updates to the exemptions, right? We know that the capital gains um, exemption um, currently is £6,000. It was reduced from last year, which was £12,300. And in after 6th of April 2024, which is in just about a month and a half's time, it will be reduced again to £3,000. So if you're somebody who's got a lot of personal investments, um, well, actually, even uh, in companies, um, and you have made a loss, right? Um, what's a very smart thing to do is to actually make a disposal, crystallize that loss, um, because losses um, from investments are actually carried forward with no time limit, right? So, for, you know, for, for pens your pension allowances, right? You can carry forward up to four, uh, three previous taxes, for example, but any losses that you have in terms of, you know, your investments, right? You can carry that forward forever and ever, right? So if you make a loss, if you register a loss right now of say 10,000 pounds and 20 years later, you sell your home, um, or like a buy to let, for example, property, and you make a gain of a hundred thousand pounds, you can offset that that ten thousand pound loss that you've made twenty years ago. So your actual gain for that buy to let property is only ninety thousand pounds. So you do get to save some tax as well. It's like having a loss account. And what is harvesting? It's you've made a loss and you don't want to actually get rid of that share because it might come bounce back up again, right? So you just basically buy it back now. If you buy back by an ISA, and this is called bed an ISA, um, then there is, you can immediately buy that share back. If you are buying that back in like a normal brokerage account in a general investment account, you do have to be careful, um, something called like wash rules, which means that you, if you cannot buy the same share within 30 days, otherwise it's going to be considered as part of the same transaction. So do be careful, but it's actually quite a smart thing to do before the end of the tax years if you do have um, losses you know, that you have in certain of your investment portfolios. Enterprise investment investment schemes, uh, we do touch on this a lot because it's again, it's quite a, you know, very, it's very, it's a UK, um, it's a quirky UK tax advantaged financial solution essentially for personal investors. So this is whereby, you know, um, you invest money into UK based startups, right? You know, smaller startups, bigger startups. Um, and as long as they qualify for the EIS scheme, right? The investor gets 30% tax relief straight away on the investment. So 10,000 pounds you put in there, you get 3,000 pounds back straight away from the government in the form of a tax refund. And if you are, for example, uh, and the best thing about this is um, you can actually use both your current tax years and your previous tax years' income tax capacity to um, offset with an enterprise investment scheme. So if you are perhaps this year, you have not worked, right? And you got a 0% taxpayer, right? But the previous tax year, you know, you were a high rate or you were additional rate taxpayer with lots of, you know, with a big tax bill, <coughs> you can actually still invest in the enterprise investment scheme and claim that 30% from your previous tax years as income tax um, liability. So again, that's one specific area where enterprise investment scheme can be quite advantageous. And if you do lose, end up losing some money, we can actually furthermore offset it against your income tax uh, rate 
which could be up to 45%, rather than a tax loss harvesting, which again, you're you're saving 20% on based on current capital gains um, rates. Venture capital trusts, which is um, a, a similar type of tax advantage investments to the enterprise investment scheme. It's a high risk, um, it's a high risk investment, but it's slightly lower risk than enterprise investment schemes because it is a listed vehicle. So there is some liquidity available and it tends to be a bit more diversified within because there are more companies inside the trust than just an enterprise investment scheme company. Now, um, you do get the same 30% tax relief upfront, right? So 10,000 pounds you put in, you get 3,000 pounds of income tax refund. You cannot carry this you know, for, uh, backwards for another previous tax year um, as compared to the enterprise investment scheme. And you do not get to offset any losses against your income tax rate. Um, so meaning that, you know, any losses on the venture capital trust is tax, you know, again, you get to save up to 20% capital gains um, tax rate rather than up to 45% income tax rates. Now, one specific aspect of the tax efficiency for venture capital trusts, VCTs, is the tax free dividends. Um, so this is in particular effective for company directors because directors tend to Directors usually tend to maximize their um, dividend allowances and then obviously take out more dividends by paying at a reduced um, tax rate compared to income to, uh, to, compared to a salary. So they any dividends they get really from any stocks and shares, right? They'd be paying the marginal dividend tax. But with venture capital trusts, then the aim for a lot of these trusts are to give out five percent of dividends every single year. Um, it's fully tax free. So if a, if a director right, who takes out 50,000 pounds a year in dividends and um, is gaining another 50,000 pounds in dividends from a venture capital trust, right, only pays dividend tax on the 50,000 pounds they take from their own company. And that 50,000 pounds of dividends they get from the venture capital trust is fully tax free. Um, so again, um, something, you know, again, very smart to consider for the business owners in particular. Um, and uh, lastly, again, you know, with the annual exemption, right, which currently is six thousand pounds, if you haven't used it, right, please do use it. If you, because it is um, only available each tax year on a use it or lose it basis, right. So just a good friendly reminder to use it or lose it. And uh, lastly, again, we always kind of touch on this one because it's uh, you know before the end of the tax years where a lot of conversations are happening within the family. If there are some intergenerational planning aspects to you know people's businesses, right? Uh, we do work with a lot of family businesses, and this is a time where they talk to their sort of you know um, next generation about what is the succession plan for this business, right? Um, usually, there's a lot of inheritance tax considerations because, especially for property companies, right? How can we start mitigating um, inheritance tax? Given that most investment companies do fall back into the estate of the director, right? So this is where we look at potential you know, family investment company structures. We look at potential setting up trusts that hold the shares of um, these kind of, you know, investment companies, right? Um, how do we make the right gifts, right, to um, the children of the next generation, right, both in the form of business shares or in the form of, you know, assets of the company, right? So, I mean, Henry, anything to add on here one, on this one? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's it's about it, not obviously if you if your children are very young um and you maybe don't think that they're necessarily able looking after the the money you want to give them uh there are trusts there to to help them with that process until they are of age uh whatever age you you decide is is uh, appropriate 18 25 so it's important as well just to consider that you don't necessarily need to wait because in inheritance tax, it's uh, you, we have something called the seven year rule. So every year, uh, every seven years that you gift something, uh, it is exempt from inheritance tax. So if you die in year number eight, any gifts you've made eight years ago are not going to count. But if you die within seven years, then anything you have made in the last seven years prior to that death would be considered for inheritance tax. So it's, the long game is always very important. Great, you know, again, thank you. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed, you know, and got some good information out of this webinar and we'll just now open it up to the floor for any uh, Q and A's. Yeah, we've got one question there. Um, uh, Neil, uh, what do you suggest 
recommend for us residents, uh, US residents with UK situation assets. Well, that's very interesting, Neil. Um, as it happens, I'm also qualified in the US uh, as a tax advisor. So the best answer to that is it, it's a very niche question. So I, I, I do suggest you uh, reach out uh, under a separate note about how to uh, do that because there's a lot of nuance here. I appreciate for many of us watching who have never, who don't have any affiliation with the US are probably going to be bored to death if I go through all of the uh, chapter and verse about the, the answer to that. The short answer is you are, if you have UK situated assets, you're going to be subject to UK tax. However, obviously you have the tax considerations in your host country, which is the US and the US, even if there's no tax due, they also want to know about reporting. So there's a reporting mechanism you have to go through because in it, unfortunately for US purposes, it doesn't matter if you are, uh, it doesn't really matter if your assets are in the UK or in South Africa or anywhere else, they just want to know where your money's kept in dollar terms. Um, my email, Neil, is, uh, is on the screen now. You should have it there, henry.s at fcg.co.uk. Uh, we happen to talk more about the nuances of US, UK, double taxation. Any other questions anyone had about uh, any, you know, maybe, Maybe you are, are maxed out for the year. You've maxed out your pensions and you maxed out your dividends. So you have uh, nothing to worry about. You can kick back and relax for the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Neil. Very informative. Uh, so let's just drop the Q&A. Melissa, do you recommend setting up a family investment company to pass uh, company assets free of IHT? So, that's a really interesting question. Um, again, that's a very specific question about inheritance tax, but the general answer to that, obviously, you know, what, if you reach out, we'll have a chat and we can talk about it more, but the sort of nutshell answer is, well, if you are setting up a family investment company, there are still going to be inheritance tax implications. Any assets that pass out, so there are a lot of anti-avoidance rules about how you can move money because effectively, if you are, as I mentioned, there's a seven year rule, but if you incorporate your, let's say rental property into a family investment company and then distribute out the family investment company via dividend to your child, then that would still fall under the rules of IHT and you still could have that seven year uh, rule to consider. So it's a very nuanced uh, answer, but there, there, there's a lot of consideration. Family investment companies as well are very, um tricky uh, uh mechanisms to work with but we, we do work a lot of them and how they work exactly is often very misunderstood because i think that, you know, companies have their own rules but when you talk about a family investment company it's usually for what's called generational wealth planning so we have to consider sort of all the all the taxes uh all the way from inheritance tax to corporation tax when talking about uh family investment companies If no one has any other questions, um, obviously feel free to drop us a line. I appreciate we sort of just skimmed the surface about a lot of high level topics, but obviously do you can find out more um, speaking to our team and just ready to talk. We're here to service uh, and, and talk to you about your problems. So if you do have any uh, questions that maybe you didn't ask in this webinar, uh, feel free to reach out. Great. Thank you, Henry. Thank you all. We'll see you later. Thank you all. Have a nice one. Bye-bye.